Well, welcome to this tutorial, which is going to look at how to reproduce an effect uh, that has been used on the Discovery Channel. And the website address for viewing the original of the effect is coming up now on the screen. Uh, but has also been reduced, reproduced rather in Cinema 4D and by Grayscale Gorilla. And check out uh, grayscalegorilla.com to see that. And I uh, got thinking how you would achieve the same effect in Houdini. And this is how it's done. Uh, but uh, let's see the effect. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And rather than go through it step by step, uh, because some of the techniques here duplicate the ones that we've already covered, in particular in the chops animation video. Uh, I thought what I would do is put the scene up on the website and just use this tutorial to walk through the key aspects of the scene. Well the first thing to say is that the method for achieving this in Houdini is really very different from the method used in Cinema 4D. And it's fair to say that it's more complicated but also that it gives you a slightly greater degree of control over what's happening. So let's dive down and see what we've got. And the first thing uh, that I did was set up an array of points onto which we're going to copy those boxes that we saw revolving earlier on. So let's have a look, and I call this initial setup, and let's have a look inside here. So let me change this so that we're hiding other objects and let's zoom in a little bit and I'm going to switch on the display of points and we can see that we've got a lot of points there but let's see how we achieve those well I start off with just a standard grid and let me turn on wire shading I'm going to turn off this the, the, the surface grid here so we just see our grid object and then on every uh, single primitive this time I create a random value uh, between uh, naught and 1 and I do that using the dollar $PR variable which is the primitive number so each of these primitives each of these faces is going to take a different primitive it's going to get a different random value and then I facet the primitive so that uh, the points of each of these are unique and we can split them up easily I then partition them and in effect what this is doing is producing a single group for each primitive. So each of these groups has just a single primitive in it and we can see that here. And as you'll remember what uh, the uh, partition node does is evaluate this rule here for every single in this case primitive in your scene and group together the primitives for which uh, this expression is the same uh, into a single group. And in this case, because we've got dollar $PR here, which is the primitive number, obviously this is going to evaluate something different for every single one of these primitives. And we're going to get, as we see here, uh, 35 groups. And I think we've got uh, 35 primitives. There we are. Now we use a for each node. And the for each node, as you can see, is going to execute once for every single group, in effect, for every single primitive and we're using a group mask group star so that's all of the groups we just created with this partition node and let's dive inside here and see what we've got so this each node uh, you get for free inside your for each and what that's doing is deleting all of the geometry that we're not going to look at in this particular iteration of the for loop uh, so what we're going to get left with is a single primitive uh, we can't see it here at the moment, but it does exist as this is executed. Uh, I then calculate uh, some parameters here, uh, which I probably should explain. In fact, they're set at this level. As you can see, I've used the Edit Parameter Interface button to add some extra parameters here. They're all float values, and it's three values which determine how many of these primitives are going to be subdivided just once so we produce four primitives from a single primitive 
How many of them are going to be subdivided twice? So we're going to get 16 primitives in this space. And how many of them are going to be subdivided not at all? And we can see that we've, we've got uh, these percentage values here. So what I do is just use a null here as a way of holding a few more parameters down here. And you can see that I've taken this, let's enlarge this, the total is in fact uh, the total of those three parameters that we've got on the for each node. And then the medium and low figures are simply the medium and low divided by that total, and in the case of the medium, plus the low figure. And the reason I do that is because then we can separate uh, our primitive, and remember we've only got a single primitive here, and we'll put it into one of three groups depending on that random value that we calculated earlier. And essentially this distributes uh, the primitive into one of these three groups with the same probability as the percentages that we set up uh, here. So it's in one of these three groups and then what we do is we subdivide either once or twice depending on whether it's in the medium group or the high group and of course uh, if it's in the low group we don't subdivide it at all. And then we facet just to make sure that all of those primitives are again independent of each other. And the result we get is this. So we can see some of these are divided into 4, some into 16, some not divided at all. Uh, the next thing I need to do is create some points. So the next step is this for each SOP here. And I've used a different technique to iterate over uh, our primitives this time uh, and I've done that using the each number option and then I'm going from a number of starting at zero and then I'm ending at 160 and in fact this is an expression uh, and if we have a look here that's taking the number of primitives that's what this nprims function does from the earlier node the for each subdivide node so this is counting up all of these primitives here and taking away one so that's giving us the number of primitives minus one and that in fact gives us a number for each primitive because the primitives are numbered zero for the number of primitives minus one that just happens to be the numbering scheme that Houdini uses for primitives so this is going to iterate over all the primitives and for each primitive what we do is uh, and because because we're iterating over the primitive numbers this each SOP here isn't actually going to delete the primitives that uh, we don't need. Uh, that only happens if we use the for group, each group option. Uh, but because we're using each number, we have to do this deletion ourselves. That's what this blast node is doing. And it takes uh, the for value from this uh, stamp name here and takes that and that's going to be set to the particular primitive we're processing at this loop and then it uh, deletes everything else and then it finds the center of that primitive and it puts a point there and we can't see the point here and we can't see the primitive either but you'll see in a second what's happening uh, the only thing that's complicated about this is the value that we give to the y parameter uh, and we give a y parameter which is the center of the bounding box of the primitive in the y direction. Now of course because our primitives are flat this is going to be zero in fact minus the maximum of the size of our primitive in the x and the z directions over two and the effect of this is going to put a point uh, that lies below the, 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 the plane here and it's halfway down the width of the primitive. Now, as it happens the primitive square so this is always going to evaluate to size x and size z are going to be the same and essentially what we're producing here is a point that lies at the center of the primitive that we've got uh, in the z and the x directions and it's down in the y direction so that it lies exactly at the point uh, that would be the center of a box if we had a box of which that primitive form part. The other thing we do 
is create a scale value. Uh, I've said p scale here. In fact, we create a value called scale, and we set it to the size of our primitive. Uh, and in the y direction, we set it to the maximum of the x and the z directions. Now, in fact, it looks like uh, I, I said earlier that my primitives were square. It looks like that that's not in fact the case. But nevertheless, this, this technique works. So we've got a scale attribute, and we've positioned the point so that it's at the center of where a box could be. And that means uh, that we could uh, instance a box on each of the points that we've just created. But of course, we've got more points than just the points that have been created here. We've got all of these points that are part of these primitives. But we can use a delete stop to delete points which are part of a polygon. And the pattern here is set to everything. So if we do that, we just get left with these points that we've just created. And as you can see, some of them lie down below the surface here. So that's produced the points which can we can instance our boxes to. And in fact, let me just do that to demonstrate that that's what's going on. So I'm just adding a copy SOP to just demonstrate this very quickly. If I copy a box to each of these nodes, we can see that it forms this array of boxes, which is what we want. And the reason that these are working is both because the center points that they're being instance to are correct, because we've set those up here in this for each loop, but also because that scale attribute that we created is used by the copy sop to scale each of our boxes precisely so that they fit into the space uh, that uh, is left by that primitive. Okay, well, we don't need this anymore. And the next step is to do with the animation of our boxes. So before we go into covering these nodes here, let me demonstrate that I've set up some boxes here at the scene level. Uh, and in fact, what I'm going to do is turn off the display of these things. Let me zoom in here and maybe we can see one of these boxes. I've got basically four variations of a box animation. Let's have a look at one of them. And let me select it and then zoom in. So this is the box, and the box animation either rotates around 270 degrees in that uh, sort of roughly 50 frame period, or we've got a variant here which goes 270 degrees. But if you can see here, I've animated it so it slightly overshoots and then comes back and corrects itself. And I've done that by adding a extra keyframe, which we can have a look here. If we have a look, we've in fact got the rotate Z scoped here. Uh, and we can see on this one, rather, that it goes up to 275 degrees and then resets itself to 270. And then, uh, separately, I've got another variation, which is a 180 degree turn. So again, that just goes 180. And in this case, it overshoots as well, like so. And then we've got a version of the 180 that doesn't overshoot. So we've got four different animations. In each case, the only thing that's being animated is this uh, rotation around the z-axis. So going back into the initial setup that we were looking at earlier, we create another random value, which in this case I'm calling anim type and this time I make it a floor of a random number plus a seed times four so it's either going to be have a value of naught one two or three and we can actually see that here if we bring up a details view if we have a look anim type here is two three two three zero and so on and again what we do is separate into groups our points on this occasion, and we separate them according to whether anim type is 1, anim type is 0, anim type is 2, anim type is 3, and so on. And then uh, we create 
a Rot Z attribute uh, for each group in turn and we copy the animation from one of those four animated boxes that I showed you and we copy it from a different one for each of these groups so that produces a slightly different type of animation on every single one of our points in other words a slightly different variation in the rotate Z as we move through the timeline on each of our points now you would have spotted that our uh, animation earlier had two phases the boxes rotate in one direction and then they rotate in another and we've set up two passes here just to give slightly different results on each of those transitions so when it moves in the one direction this is the first pass and when it comes back in the second direction that's the second pass so let's just see what we do inside here well, the first thing we do is merge in uh, the points that we created in our initial setup. I can then select a set of points which I've called title group and in fact in the final animation I didn't add titles but the aim of this is to leave a space on our array of boxes which come the end of the transition are going to be flat. They're not going to be amongst the boxes which have a slight angle to them and that means we could overlay across uh, this area a title or something else that we needed to be flat and you can see that technique used in the discovery channel animation itself and then for this group uh, title group we set an, uh, an attribute is title we give it a value of one and obviously where uh, the group isn't that's going to default to the default value which is zero and then I create something called sticky and sticky is an attribute which is going to determine whether or not the box rotates all the way around and lies nice flat after the transition or whether it gets stuck at a certain point before the end of its rotation uh, and again I, I do this using a variation of the point number uh, and in this case in fact I've left in uh, a parameter phase which I'm not I'm not using and the sticky proportion here uh, enables you to select what proportion of the boxes are going to get stuck and in this case about a third of them are going to get stuck. The other thing that we vary is exactly when the boxes are going to start rotating and broadly speaking uh, we take a value for this first phase which is moving as you recall from the left to the right we take a value that's based on the bounding box in the x direction and let's just see that so what we've got here uh, is some extra parameters again which I've added using the add parameters button and I've given a first start time and a last start time so this is the variance uh, that's possible in the start time uh, the, the time at which the particular box we're dealing with instance to this point will start rotating uh, this controls how much randomness there will be in when that start happens and obviously the seed is used to vary the random number. So we take the first start time, we add to it the position within the bounding box in the x direction. So this is something that varies from 0 to 1 across the whole array of points. And then we multiply that uh, by the last start time so obviously if, if this is right at the end of our array of boxes this is going to have a value of last start time and then we randomize that a little bit here and we can see uh, that this is what this formula here does it randomizes that value so that it it has a certain random component so this means that all of our boxes are going to start rotating at a slightly different time but broadly uh, they're going to move start rotating from left to right and the other thing that we vary is how long it takes them to rotate we're going to stretch out that animation uh, a different amount for each of the boxes so again this is just really creating a random value which we're putting into an attribute on each point called rotate length uh, 
In this case, rotate length means the length of time it takes to do the rotation. And in fact, there's a null left in here, which I no longer need. I can delete that. Uh, and then we have an out null just to uh, say where we're, we're finishing our network. So that's the first pass. The second pass is identical, except that obviously we choose a different group for title group. We use a different seed for our stickiness and for our start offset and for our rotate length so that on the way back different uh, cubes are going to start uh, differently and in particular in this case uh, the start offset we use one minus the bounding box in x and that means that it's the reverse of what we had last time and we're going to move from right towards left because the bounding box in the x direction uh, bbx dollar bbx which is this thing that we're using here dollar bbx this is our bounding box x moves in that direction so dollar bbx here will be zero dollar bbx here will be one and obviously if you take one minus that points near here will have a one minus bbx is zero and here that one so it's going to reverse the, the the direction of that sweep and again we create a rotate length and again we use a different seed so that that's going to be different so the result of this is that uh, for the second phase, where our boxes are rotating back, uh, we are setting up new values of when they'll start and how long they'll take to rotate, which produces some nice variation. So we need to bring the first phase and the second phase, or the first pass and the second pass together. And that's what we do here. And we do it in this combined geometry node and what we bring in is not in fact the data from those first or second passes we bring in the original points which we created in our initial setup and again we create a rot z parameter uh, attribute rather we move up here uh, and this time we just give it a value of zero and the purpose of that is so that each of these points does actually have a rot z attribute and the importance of that will be evident in a second we then bring these into chops, and there's a chop net here, and I'm going to go through them in a second. And then we bring the rot z value out of chops and assign it to each of those points. And then we copy uh, right up here there's a box, um, the box which I faceted so that it has uh, straight edges rather than those edges being smoothed in the render I faceted. So we take a box and then we're copying it to each of those points. And this transform node is using a stamp. We've set up a copy stamp here for two attributes. Rot Z, uh, which is obviously the Z rotation, and AT, which is the animation type. And I'll show you in a second why we, we bother to stamp the animation type. The animation type, if you remember, was the thing that we used to select between those different variance on the rotation of the box. So we set those two things up here, as stamp inputs, and that means we can use a stamp function, here is one, to retrieve those values for each individual copy we make. And in this case we retrieve the rot z value, rot z value, and we put it into a transform here, we, we negative it and then put it in a transform here and that's going to ensure that each of our boxes is rotated according to the rot z attribute of the point that it's being instanced to and then we have a switch node and the switch node is here to assign some materials to our boxes and I will go through these materials now we've got uh, some materials set up in our material palette, or rather in our shop context. Let's just have a quick look. Uh, and they're basically just a constant material that's set to red, to green, or to blue. And then I've got a clay material, which I'm going to use in a moment. So let's go back to our combined geometry. So we've got two variations of the assignment of these materials. And the reason for that is that what I'm going to do in the compositor is composite over the different images using uh, 
a substitution. So one image will be substituted where our render shows red, another one where our render shows blue, and where our render shows green, we're going to substitute uh, a render of a of a pass of a sort of neutral coloured block moving around, and that's what you see in between as the as the cube is rotating. So it's important we get these set up correctly so that once uh, the cube has rotated we're left with a blue face uppermost. And the reason we need two variations here according to the animation type is because uh, this, uh, these cubes have different animations. Some of them are rotating by 270 degrees and some of them only by 180. So for the ones that are rotating 270 uh, it's this face here that will need to be red and for the ones that are blue rather and for the ones that are rotating over 100, only 180 it's the face here on the bottom that needs to be blue so if we scrub through we can see that these rotate over and eventually all become blue and that means we can substitute quite uh, easily our different pictures and this is done using the switch node, which is going to compare the animation type attribute, which we're stamping. And if it's less than two, uh, which means it's the, I think, the version of the box which uh, rotates 270 degrees, uh, then it applies a set of materials to the sides of the box here uh, using these material nodes. And if it's greater than two, in other words, it's only rotating 180 degrees, then it applies those colors, those materials, differently. And the material SOP, as you notice, takes a group. In this case, it's just the number of the side of the particular cube that we're processing uh, and assigns a material on a per-primitive basis. So we can assign a material to each of the primitives that make up that cube separately. And the final version of the switch, uh, which we're going to use in a moment, and you can see this is the last connector, uh, just assigns no materials at all. And since this is an if statement uh, that's driving uh, the switch, an if statement, rather a conditional statement, this is less than two, conditional statement always evaluates to naught or one. So unless we do something special, this third input, whoops, didn't mean to get rid of it, that third input is never actually going to be chosen always going to choose either the first input here which has its input number zero or it's going to use the second one here which is input number one it's never going to use input number two because this can never evaluate to two uh, but we'll see why we do this in a moment so I've left till last this chop network because that's the most interesting part of the setup and in fact I've deleted the two chops node here because it was misleading uh, because we don't actually take data from here into chops all we're doing here is creating an empty attribute and then we're filling it with values which come out of our chop network so let's dive down into our chop network and the other thing that I should say is that in fact in this setup I didn't use the animation uh, length parameter uh, I didn't multiply these animations by different length so they all animate over the same time period but it's fairly trivial to change the time period so let's have a look and I've got a motion view here so that we can see what we're doing uh, first of all we get from the first pass uh, and let's just select this so we can see it we get from that first pass setup uh, and the out null that we had there the rot z attribute and we have the animated method which means that we're getting a channel for every single point in that geometry and then I'm using a math node to multiply this and I'm multiplying it by an if expression and let's enlarge this so we can see what that is and the if expression evaluates its first parameter and if its first parameter is greater than zero, 
it then returns this second parameter and if this first parameter is zero it returns the third parameter here in other words it evaluates whether this is true and returns this if it is true and this if it's false so in this case we're drawing a point attribute and we're drawing it again out of that first pass geometry that we set up and we're using a point number of dollar c and the reason we can use dollar c is dollar c is the channel number but in this case of course we've got a channel for every single point uh, every single value of rot z every single attribute of rot z every point has a different dollar c value and dollar c in fact equals the point number from which we drew the channel that we're evaluating so in this case uh, we can pick up the sticky attribute that we created for the point that we're evaluating and if that sticky attribute is greater than zero then we multiply our channel by a random value that's very slightly less than one and if this on the other hand is zero the sticky value is zero then we multiply it by one in other words this node has no effect so the result of that and we can see that probably best up here is that we get values here of the final rotation which are varied and some of them are less than the full 270 degrees and that means uh, that we're going to get those blocks not making it all the way around in our animation and getting stuck so what I next do is trim uh, this these channels so that they lie in the range 0 to 2 seconds and we can see here let me just adjust this like this we can see here that uh, this is going from 0 to 48 frames and since we're running at 24 frames per second that's 2 seconds and this now stops here the reason I've chopped it off here trimmed it here and it's important to have this on absolute if you want to get it to trim to a precise time the reason I've done this is so that I can mirror these channels using a cycle node and we get then the reverse of the animation so this is rotating up to final value and then back again and because I've got the reverse I can then trim off our first cycle and just have the return or reverse cycle and then I can shift each of these a little bit according to the value of our start offset and so these are each moving uh, each moved a little bit to the right each delayed by a little bit according to the start offset uh, and then on the return value of course we've also got to have some stickiness we've got to have uh, some of these which don't rotate back completely to zero so again we need to create uh, some random values and what I do here is multiply them uh, by a value which is random sorry which is 0 0.8 or 1 and this is depending if they're sticky or not and we're using the value of sticky from the second pass here so if it is sticky then we multiply it by 0 0.8 and then we add uh, a small random value between 0 and 35 to it if it's not sticky we just multiply it by 1 and add nothing in other words it has no effect and then what we do is minimize or rather take the minimum of those two channels so it will start from exactly the same place but as it gets down to here if it disappears below this value that we've created here it'll just stick there it won't go bound to zero it'll go down to that random value between 0 and 35 that we set up here and then um, we push all of this back to four seconds and then we combine it using a sequence node with the result of our just the first part of our animation uh, which I've shifted again using the start value uh, in this case the first part 
the start offset. And we shift all of these a little bit. Uh, and then we sequence the two together here so that what we get in total, let's have a look, is our boxes rotating up to either 180 or 270 degrees or more or less with a little bit of variation and then rotating back except that some of them don't make it all the way back to zero and as I mentioned earlier the thing that I haven't implemented here which I intended to was a variation a stretch on these channels so that they took a different amount of time to make their rotations in fact all of these are making the rotations in the same amount of time and then we have an out here and our channel SOP here is picking up the values from that out. It's picking up the rot Z value and it's dumping it into our points where it determines the rotation of all of those boxes, which is why uh, when we go back to the scene view, our boxes rotate round, wait for a bit, and then rotate back. So I'd recommend if you if you didn't follow that chop net explanation particularly well, have a look at the earlier videos on chops. Finally, let's have a look at our output nodes, or almost finally. And we've got two here, the first of which is just a very basic mantra setup to render to a file here and it's rendering just that combined bit of geometry that I've just been talking about and it doesn't have any lights because we have constant shaders applied to our cube got headlight creation turned off as well so this is going to render out 180 frames of that and we'll have a look at that in a minute and the second render node which is connected to the first so that when we render this one the first will also render through is using physically based rendering to render uh, again uh, that combined geometry but in this case with an environment light applied and I've got uh, in fact uh, a uh, well I won't uh, I won't show now but there is a an HDR map applied to that environment light to give us a nice subtle effect and that again is licensed under a Creative Commons license and I've, I've given the acknowledgements for that at the end of the video as well. So uh, this is rendering out uh, using an environment light and it uses a take here called env render. I've got to take this and we can see what that does. That take is only changing the value of this switch input. So if I go back here to my combined geometry this is this switch here. What I'm doing is setting the value of the input to, uh, when we have this take selected, it's setting that value to 2. And that means it's taking this input here, the one which bypasses these materials, uh, and that means these materials won't be used. Instead, the material set here on the material tab of the geometry, in other words, the clay material will be used. So this is rendering out a pass which illuminates the scene using a nice environment light and has a clay material applied to our blocks. Let me move back to the main take. And we can see what these renders look like by having a look at the compositing network, which is the final part of the setup. And this is the RGB part of the render that I was mentioning earlier. And if we have a look at our compositor, we can see that this is just the plain colors like so and this is going to be the basis for our composite uh, and I've then got my pictures let me just have a look at those I've got here uh, a forest picture which we can see there uh, a moss picture and probably I should be resizing these if I haven't bothered. Uh, these are all off Flickr, and again, the acknowledgements are at the end of the video. And I'm using a blend here, and the reason I'm using a blend is because at the beginning of my render, uh, at the beginning of my composite, rather, 
I want my uh, forest to appear. Uh, the blocks then rotate round. Uh, and then what I want is when they rotate back again, instead of the forest coming back, I want this other image to come back. So I've animated here the blend parameter so that it has a value of 1 at the beginning here, but when we want our moss to appear, it has a value of 0. And so I've just animated it, depending on the frame, to show one or the other image. And so we take our black background and then we composite over this moss or tree image, depending on the frame number. And we're using the red component uh, as the mask. So this is only going to appear where our RGB image has red. So right at the beginning, uh, it's almost all red. We seem to be missing frame one. I'm not sure why that is. But uh, here we are. We can see uh, that uh, we have our trees image almost completely. Then as we move through uh, the animation, we'll get to a point, here we are, where that blue will start disappearing and we'll end up getting black spaces where this mask is no, no longer red. So we need to fill in these black spaces and what we do is fill it in with uh, our second image in the case of the blue colors which are coming in and our second image is going to be, where are we? Uh, our second image is going to be our flower. Here we are. Uh, and in this case, I'm blending between our flower and our image uh, of the environment render. And the reason I'm doing that is because when the boxes start rotating a little bit just here, if I didn't have this, a little bit of that flower image would show through these cracks. And so what I've done is started off at the low frames where this with a blend of zero. So this is just bringing in this environment render that we're seeing here. And as we get to the point where the blocks are rotating, uh, this becomes the flower image. So again, we composite that over uh, using the blue component. So where the box looks blue, we're going to get the flower. And then finally, uh, for where the boxes are green, we composite that environment render that we saw earlier, which is where we're getting this type of effect. And the whole lot is got a null here, and then I can add a prop file output to render that out to a file, or in this case, to my viewer. So that's a complete description of the setup of this reproduction of the discovery node transition, the discovery channel transition effect. Uh, I hope it's been useful.